Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is the part 4 of Adrenal Gland Pathology series and in this section let's learn about congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Right? In the next 10 to 15 minutes we will be looking at what androgenital syndromes mean and then in detail about congenital adrenal hyperplasia we will look into the types, the clinical features, the morphology, the diagnosis and treatment aspects of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this is what we have been uh, learning in the last uh, three sessions, right? We talked about hyperfunction of uh, glucocorticoids, hyperfunction of mineralocorticoids and in today's session we will look into hyperfunction of sex steroids, that is hyperfunction of zona reticularis and we will be uh, discussing about androgenital syndromes. So we all know that the cells of zona reticularis, they secrete sex steroids which are basically weak androgens which are later converted to testosterone and estrogen and these weak androgens are dehydroepiandrosterone and then androstenedione right so this is converted into testosterone in the peripheral tissues the peripheral tissues meaning it is converted in the skin fat as well as the muscle tissue right but what it is important to note that this conversion is not under the control of gonads. Gonads, when I say gonads, it could be either ovaries in females or testes in males, right? Whereas it is controlled by adrenocorticotrophic hormone, which is a hormone from pituitary gland, right? So that is the difference between gonadal androgens versus adrenal androgens right so what is the function of this testosterone what is the function of these you know sex hormones in case of females it is responsible for the onset of adrenarche which means there is pubic and axillary hair growth before full sexual development and that full sexual development takes place with the help of gonadal hormones now, let us see what are androgenital syndromes. They are basically disorders of sexual differentiation. Most important ones being virilization or feminization. Now, to understand this, let us understand the concepts between hirsutism, virilization and feminization. So, hirsutism means there is excessive growth of coarse hair in women in a male pattern. Most often the hair is found on the face, chest and back which is normally not supposed to be seen in case of females and there are no other male sexual characteristics. It's just the growth of coarse hair right in a male pattern. Now what is virilization? Virilization meaning it is hirsutism plus other male characteristics. Okay, which is found in females or very young children. There is deepening of the voice, increased muscle mass, reduction in the breast size and enlargement of the clitoris. So, this happens when there is a significant hormonal imbalance. That is what we will be looking at in today's session. That's about congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Feminization means development of female physical characteristics in males. Right? Like breast enlargement, reduced body hair and redistribution of fat etc. Now these disorders of sexual differentiation can be either primary gonadal disorders or primary adrenal disorders because we know that the androgens can be synthesized both by gonads as well as the adrenal gland right. So what are those primary gonadal disorders? It could be hyper or hypogonadism, could be Turner's or Kleinfelder syndrome, could be gonadal dysgenesis, could be ovarian tumor, testicular tumor and so on. So that's about primary gonadal disorders. Primary adrenal disorders can be either neoplasm or congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Among neoplasms, it is the carcinoma which is more commonly, you know, implicated in the development of these, um, you know, excess androgens as compared to that of benign neoplasms. So what is congenital or adrenal hyperplasia, they result from several autosomal recessive inherited metabolic errors which is characterized by a deficiency of a particular enzyme which is involved in the biosynthesis of cortisol. Very, very important to note that this disorder is because of a deficiency of an enzyme which is involved in the biosynthesis of cortisol. So, for that we need to understand the normal synthesis of the various adrenal, you know, steroid hormones. 
Firstly, let us talk about hypothalamus and pituitary. So, hypothalamus under various stressors, you know, it releases corticotrope releasing hormone, which then guides the pituitary to release more and more ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And this adrenocorticotropic hormone, you know, makes the adrenal gland to take more and more cholesterol into the gland and through this cholesterol there is conversion of cholesterol into pregnenolone and through pregnenolone with the help of 17 hydroxylase gets converted to 17 hydroxy pregnenolone and then further into dehydroxy epiandrosterone right and this pregnenolone can be converted to progesterone which further gets converted to 11-deoxycorticosterone and then to corticosterone, finally forming aldosterone. These numbers represent the enzymes, 21 representing 21 hydroxylase and 11-11 hydroxylase enzymes, right? So, progesterone can further gets converted to 17 hydroxyprogesterone, which then gets converted to androstenedione and then androstenedione gets converted to testosterone. Another important pathway which is relevant in the context of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is conversion of 17 hydroxyprogesterone into 11 deoxycortisol with the help of the enzyme 21 hydroxylase and then converting into cortisol with the help of 11 hydroxylase. So, we know now. So, what we know now is the adrenal cortex is responsible for the production of three important hormones aldosterone, cortisol, and testosterone. Aldosterone is from the zona glomerulosa, cortisol is from the zona fasciculata and testosterone is from the zona reticularis, right? Now, how is this secretion controlled? What is the regulation? Once you have, you know, adequate amounts of cortisol, what happens is that this allows a negative feedback to the hypothalamus, okay, and the pituitary to reduce the secretion of ACTH. Now, consider a scenario where there is deficiency of 21 hydroxylase. There is no formation of aldosterone, there is no formation of cortisol. So, consequently, there is decreased aldosterone, there is decreased cortisol, right? And because there is decreased cortisol, there is inhibition of this feedback mechanism itself. Thereby, no, there is uninhibited production of adrenocorticotrophic hormone from the pituitary. So, what happens when there is uninhibited release of adrenocorticotrophic hormone? Obviously, there will be hyperplasia of the adrenal glands, right? Hyperplasia of the adrenal cortex, basically. And once there is hyperplasia of adrenal cortex, more and more cholesterol is there, more and more pregnenolone is formed, and then all these steps are increased ultimately resulting in increase in the testosterone now i hope you understood the concepts behind 21 hydroxylase deficiency resulting in increase in the testosterone and it is this increase in testosterone which is responsible for the clinical manifestations of congenital adrenal hyperplasia right so that is what we are going to read that's about congenital adrenal hyperplasia and then what we need to understand is that what causes 21 hydroxylase deficiency the most important cause being mutation in the gene this is cyp21a2 gene which codes for the enzyme 21 hydroxylase whenever you have a mutation in this cyp21a2 gene then that results in 21 hydroxylase deficiency right and this is an autosomal recessive inheritance note that the gene for this enzyme 21 hydroxylase is situated in the short arm of the chromosome number 6 right now the mutations can be point mutations insertions deletions and gene conversions depending upon the type of mutation depending upon the severity of the mutation the congenital adrenal hyperplasia is categorized into three different categories one the mutations is such that absolutely there is no enzyme activity that is absence of enzyme activity total lack of enzymes the second one being reduced enzyme activity the third one which is much more milder form very very partial deficiency 
Now, what happens when there is absence of the entire 21 hydroxylase? There is no aldosterone, no cortisol, right? When there is no aldosterone, obviously the patient manifests with salt wasting, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia, and they also present and they also continue to develop acidosis, hypotension, and cardiovascular collapse. Which the symptoms of these are usually found few days after the birth. So that's why this particular entity is also referred to as salt wasting syndrome, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a salt wasting syndrome type. So if you don't have cortisol and you know that there is no feedback inhibition, more and more ACTH and then there is more and more formation of testosterone, what we saw earlier, leading to the virilization. Okay, So these patients have virilization, along with that they have salt wasting syndrome. When you have reduced enzyme activity, in this case, you know, the aldosterone level is sufficient enough, but then the cortisol is still decreased for it to inhibit the feedback regulation. So, again, more and more ACTH is being released, causing all the manifestation. There is no salt wasting here, but then there is progressive virilization. Okay. So, in the case of infant girls, they present with clitoral enlargement and pubic hair you know that's the most common mode of presentation of uh, this type of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is manifesting itself as ambiguous genitalia whenever a newborn is seen with ambiguous genitalia that means you will not be able to make out what sex the newborn baby is that is when you need to suspect that this could be a case of congenital adrenal hyperplasia in infant girls there will be clitoral enlargement and pubic hair whereas in and boys usually they present with sexual precocity and that's why this is called as simple virilizing androgenital syndrome without salt wasting the third one which is a much more milder form because of very partial deficiency of the hormone this fortunately is the most common one very very mild manifestations these patients will have in young women know they manifest with hirsutism acne and menstrual irregularities most often these are the kind of you know um, patients or individuals who are often confused with symptoms of pcod polycystic ovarian disease no symptoms in case of young men and that's why this is referred to as a non classic or a late onset adrenal virilism so, we saw that 21 hydroxylase deficiency that constitutes for around 95% of cases. Remaining 5% of cases can be due to 11 hydroxylase deficiency because we know even if there is a deficiency of 11 hydroxylase, there will be no aldosterone, no cortisol, no feedback inhibition, increased ACTH, and then all the manifestations of increased testosterone level. Okay, so 21 hydroxylase deficiency being more common 95 percent of cases so what is the morphology of adrenal glands in these cases if this is a normal you know kidney with a very small rim of adrenal gland these are called you know kidney hats the adrenal glands are small triangular structures in case of congenital adrenal hyperplasia they are bilaterally hyperplastic right the weight of these organs will be around 10 to 15 times their normal weight and the cort you know the adrenal gland is thickened with a nodular cortical external surface right on cut section the cortex is widened which is and also brownish normally it will be yellowish in cut section because of lot of lipid in the normal adrenal gland whereas in these cases because of depletion of these hormones the cells are much more darker and that's why the cortical uh, cut surface looks more brown that's because of lipid depletion on histopathological examination what you see the cells are proliferative which is more compact and the cells are often eosinophilic lipid depleted cells and most of this most of these cells are lipid depleted because they have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm of course they are intermixed with few lipid laden cells here and there so that's a histopathology finding in congenital adrenal hyperplasia so we have talked about the clinical features of congenital adrenal hyperplasia the salt wasting syndrome is more fatal form among the three non classic or late onset is the most common one whereas simple virilizing androgenital syndrome is the one which manifests most often with ambiguous genitalia so how do you diagnose you have to suspect congenital adrenal hyperplasia whenever you see a neonate with ambiguous genitalia do a serum levels of aldosterone and cortisol obviously it will be decreased 
and the serum levels of 17 hydroxy progesterone okay the earlier forms they will be elevated and sometimes you know you can do a genetic analysis of cyp2a2 gene basically to predict the phenotypic severity right so how do you treat these patients usually by supplementation of steroid hormones because you don't have aldosterone you don't have cortisol you have to supplement cortisol by giving exogenous glucocorticoids which also suppress the acth levels okay once the acth levels are suppressed that decreases the excessive synthesis of the steroid hormones particularly the testosterone mineralocorticoid supplementation is given in the salt wasting variant of congenital adrenal hyperplasia so that's all about androgenital syndrome particularly the congenital adrenal hyperplasia if you have liked this video hit the like button do comment if you have any queries to ask if you find this channel useful please do consider subscribing this channel and then don't forget to share so that somebody else can benefit out of this Thank you.